Ron is also a Pulitzer Prize winning uh, author. Uh, he's written a book called Hope in the Unseen, which is my wife's uh, favorite uh, book. Uh, he's written a book called Confidence Man about the U.S. economy and the presidency of Barack Obama, the 1% document, doctrine about how the U.S. government frantically improvised to fight a new kind of war uh, after 9-11. Uh, but today he's here not as a journalist or as an author, he's really here as a father whose uh, life has been touched by um, the life of his, his son, uh, Owen, who at the age of three uh, stopped talking uh, and was uh, subsequently diagnosed with uh, autism. Uh, and uh, Ron and his wife uh, Cornelia have really been on this incredible uh, journey uh, ever since then, trying to figure out how to uh, connect with their uh, son, and, uh, and as you'll hear, uh, using Disney movies, they were able, able to unlock uh, their son and develop this incredibly profound uh, connection with him that is really an extraordinary uh, story. Uh, we had, Laurie and my wife and I had the privilege of hearing about this story about two years ago when we were at dinner with uh, Ron and Cornelia at a mutual friend's house. Uh, and that uh, night after uh, Ron described this book that he was working on about his film family's experience and said that he was struggling with the title, my wife uh, went home, came up with about half a dozen uh, titles that she sent to Ron, one of which was uh, Life Animated, which is the title of his book, and now the uh, documentary that really showcases this incredible uh, story about love, uh, autism, and, uh, and uh, hope. So uh, Ron is, uh, I'm thrilled, is here today to share his, uh, his experience uh, with, uh, with autism, uh, with, with his uh, family. Uh, he has also uh, developed, uh, based on his family's experience, uh, a new uh, company that called Sidekicks, which is trying to use technology to help other families uh, get uh, affected by autism uh, connect with one another. And so uh, please help me give us a very warm Hub Week and MGH welcome to Ron. Thank you, Peter. Um, I've already thanked Laurie many times. Without Laurie, I don't know what this book would have been called, actually. Uh, so she has a very attractive royalty arrangement. Every copy, uh, what is it, a quarter, a dime? How much do you get? <laughs> it is fun. Now, Laurie is, is a brilliant woman and also an English major from college. So when uh, we looked at the titles, we said, boy, that is good. And I called Laurie back and said, you are the winner. Uh, when you write books, it's interesting, because you get very close to it. You're right in the forest. Um, and uh, it's sometimes hard to step back to write the title, actually. Uh, many of the books, Cornelia actually was the title giver, my wife. Uh, but on this one, she was right in the thick of it with me. So, um, so we uh, were able to step back by telling the story to the Slavins. And that's a part of what's happening here. Um, you know, so much of, of the story that we lived is about a uh, narrative. You know, narrative seems like kind of a big $22 word for story, and it is that. It's a bit more than that, though. And I teach a class at Harvard Law School called Public Narrative and Justice, uh, which is just about what it seems uh, from the title to be about. It's about these big narratives we live within as a society the stories we tell ourselves as individuals, the story a country tells itself as to who it is. Uh, these large ecosystems of narrative um, are a place, a landscape, where I've fought for 20 years against presidents and foreign leaders on the issues of race and class, opportunity, all the big fault line issues. And I came to understand how often we are creatures of narrative, narratives constructed by others that we don't really understand. We're kind of living in a fish tank of a narrative someone else built, so that we think certain things, make certain assumptions, um, without even knowing it, arrive at certain actions. Uh, part of the process of understanding that was um, uh, finding a teacher, uh, an unlikely teacher, uh, and I'll tell you about him in a minute. Well, let me tell you the story. Uh, you're going to see some clips here, because this, this will be fun. You're going to see a little bit of the movie. There is a book called Life Animated that came out in 2014. Some of you may remember that. It's a lot of media, a lot of national media. 
Uh, and um, I spoke at the United Nations uh, and, and in front of Congress, and Tom Hensel had me come down to NIH. Um, and around that time, we started working on a movie, a documentary film, uh, with a terrific documentarian, a guy named Roger Ross Williams, who's the first African American to win the Academy Award for documentary, any Academy Award, in fact. And, um, and he's someone I'd known for years. We used to do stuff at ABC and PBS in the early aughts. And so Roger signed up, and there is an extraordinary piece of cinema in the movie theaters this summer. And now being embraced around the country, um, I dare say we're on a couple of those short lists for the little, the little gold statue. Walter, Owen's older brother, says, I, I just, I just want to go. I don't even care if I win, if I just get to go. Uh, you'll see some scenes from the movie. Um, let me tell you the backstory. And then I'll show you a clip. So, so 25 years ago, uh, we're living here in your neighborhood. Uh, we lived in Dedham, actually. I was at the Wall Street Journal uh, as a reporter. Actually, before that, I worked in a magazine called Boston Business, the Boston Business Journal. You know. But then the journal signed me on. Uh, I was teaching a class at Harvard. I do a little NPR. And, um, and we were living a fabulous life in our little starter home in Dedham. You know, not, not on the good side of town, on the other side, you know, near where the sheriff deputies work, you know, in that little prison. And so, uh, but it was perfect. It was a perfect life. And we don't actually use that word perfect anymore, but back then we did. You know, a little house, two lovely children, you know, Owen's two and a half, Walt's five. And, um, and it's a planet, really a continent of normal. We didn't really know we were living in that continent at the time. We wouldn't know it until later, when we were exiled from it. But there it was. And I got this terrific job in Washington as the Wall Street Journal senior national affairs writer. I and mean, this is a job you've got to kill people to get. And I killed 10 people to get this job. <laughs> Family men, nice guys too. And, um, and off we went, the moving vans seeking this future, all the things we were taught to want, I suppose, right up ahead. So the scene you're about to see is on the bridge of that. It's the before time. So this is the little house in Dedham, and this is what seemed like a totally typically developing two-and-a-half-year-old Owen Susskind. We're in the backyard doing a father something that seems utterly unremarkable. We're doing uh, Peter Pan. Everyone knows that movie? Disney, 1958, I think. Um, and so watch this clip, and then we'll get started. Daddy and I. Turn the volume up. Can you hear this? Fighting with swords in the leaves. Oh, who are you? I'm Peter Pan. Oh, I'm Captain Hook. You're Peter Pan. Okay. Come on, man. You're a demon. <laughs> There's a video we came across, and then once we found it, we couldn't stop watching. Oh, thank you, thank you. That's very sweet. <coughs> now, now, in a way, it's it's just an unremarkable video of a dad and a son playing. I'm chasing Owen around, he's chasing me around. He's Peter Pan, I'm Captain Hook. Oh no! At the time we shot it, I'm in my early 30s. I'm a reporter for the Wall Street Journal. And our life is taking shape just the way we want it. We had two beautiful boys, we just had our second boy. We had a little tiny house, but it was just like our dream house. Say hi to mommy. Hi, mommy. Hi, Dad. You know, everything was falling into place. But all of a sudden, at three years old, Owen vanishes. We moved to Washington, hubbub, boxes unpacked, new rented house in Georgetown. 
Walter in a new school, uh, Dad in a new job. Um, Cornelia is mostly driving Owen around. He's still at home. Um, she's a journalist too, like me, but she's staying home with Owen in those years. And um, a couple weeks in, she's like, something is wrong with Owen. What do you mean something's wrong with him? He's, he's unhappy. He's always been a very happy kid. He's crying a lot. And he doesn't seem to be looking back at you when you look at him. A couple more weeks pass. You know, every day she has a new story. He's, he's losing language. I said, what do you mean he's, he's losing language? He's not, <laughs> he's not talking to me. He doesn't seem to be making his needs known. Two months pass, and that 200-word vocabulary you're seeing here, 300 maybe, typical, uh, is shrunk down to a single word, juice. And we know something has gone terribly wrong. That's when we found this video. So we go to the doctor. And he says, you're out, you're out of my league. You need a specialist. And we see a specialist at a center down in the Washington area. You know, she does what they did back then, the tests. Um, she has Owen um, and me at one end of a hall. She and Cornelia are at the other end. And she says, have Owen walk to me. And I squat down next to him. And I say, just, just walk like you used to walk in denim, just this one. Weaves down the hall. Someone walking with their eyes shut. Cornelius scoops them up. I don't know if I've ever seen her hug him so tight. She said later, I thought I would just hug this out of you. I'd squeeze you so tight. I would just love this out of you, whatever this is. And then we sit down with the doctor. Owen's on the rug. Cornelia and I are in the chairs. And she says, this is a pervasive developmental disorder uh, called autism. Now, what do we know? It's 2000, it's 1994. This is not like 2016. You know, we knew Rain Man. It's 1988. It's all most people knew. The hit movie that everybody watches, that was public education. And the fact is, I teach it at Harvard. These moments of public education, off through cinema, you know, overwhelm a hundred rooms like this. Sadly, often. But that's what we knew. And I'm thinking, you're saying my son is like Dustin Hoffman in that movie? Are you crazy? She said, well, actually, some of them never get their speech back. And this is going to make everything different in your life. I don't think we heard anything after that. I mean... Cornelia and I remember it like it happened on Tuesday. I mean, literally, we lifted out of our bodies. We were floating on the drop ceiling, looking down at these parents in the chairs, Owen looking at his hands on the rug. You know, those people in the chairs, they did not leave uh, that office with us, the ones who walked in. I used to miss them. I don't, don't anymore. In quite a while, in fact. Because everything was about to change. You know, first off, we had to demonize this doctor. Quickly. <laughs> a friend of mine is a brilliant guy. You may know him. Jorge Plutsky. He's a cardiologist in Bergen. Terrific guy. One of my oldest friends. He's got this brilliant father, now past, named Max Plutsky. who was like a kind of a god of psychiatry. He's, he's a, they're Cuban Jews. They're Jubans. Yeah, I'm Jubans. There's a lot of them, actually. Yeah. Yeah, they, was, they took the wrong turn from Ellis Island. They went down south. But Max is a terrific guy. A lot of you clinicians and others. I, later, years later, I was talking to Max about this and that. And he says something to me. Uh, he says, respect denial. He said, what? Respect denial. You and Jorge, you're truth people, young people. Truth is good. But truth is not always what people can face. Denial is a very important mechanism to help people get up that next morning. And it's crucial to our architecture. 
respect it. I didn't even recognize it. So we demonized the doctor. We were in 10 minutes in the car. She was already the ice queen. That's where you do it. We had to find another doctor. We did. Oddly, I felt this amazing bond with this man, Alan Rosenbaum. He's a, he's a Jewish guy uh, that tall. And um, instantly we were bonded. I'm like, he's my guy. He was treating us more than Owen. He didn't use the A word. He says, oh, well, this is actually called PDDNOS. Pervasive Developmental Disorder Not Otherwise Specified. My God, I love that term. That's utterly meaningless. And then he helped us by saying this may be a delay, which is not really the case. But he was trying to make sure we didn't run out of his office. Great guy, dear friend, key doctor. One of the many doctors, clinicians, Therapists who helped us raise our child over the years. Of course, our life was dramatically different. Alan said to me at one point, he's like, oh, what is it you do? I said, me? You, you, you. Oh, I'm a reporter. He said, oh, that's a very cool job. Yeah, for the Wall Street Journal. Huh. Uh, you good with numbers? He said, yeah. Mets and Mets, I test okay. You know, investment banking, nice, nice profession. What are you talking about? You just paid me 120 bucks for this. It's not covered. You need me three times a week. I said, oh. Look, I, this is all I do. This is my thing. I'm a story guy. I, so we've been really good at it. And he was right. Five months in, we're totally bankrupt. I have to borrow money from my mother. I mean, the interest rates were very reasonable, but I'm, I'm joking. She didn't. And we just were lost. Interestingly, I work with the folks at the Lurie Center now. And they actually have a room now where parents go after they hear the diagnosis, which I love, actually. You know, soft music. It's a cozy place. Someone goes in there with them. It helps them say, look, this isn't a death sentence for your child. This does not mean your child will ever live a life of dependency. It's just a change, and a change that will in itself change over years. So what happens? We're running around to do everything we can. Cornelius says, look, I have my job for the rest of my life, him. And your job is to make more money than any reporter in the history of newspapers. So get out of here. <laughs> Owen is silent. He cannot make his needs or wants known. That's a really tricky situation. But he seems to suggest that the one thing he loved before the onset of the autism, he still loves, which is watch the Disney animated movies. Now, now every kid watched them in this era. You know, my kids are 25 and 27. So if you remember Disney history, which I know many of you studied, uh, Disney had a bad couple decades after Walt kicked the bucket. And then they come roaring back in 1989 with a movie called The Little Mermaid. How many people here have seen The Little Mermaid? Every, so, you didn't see it? You not seen it. Well, just one person has not seen the movie. I know, but, you know, this was like the biggest movie of the year. Not even just animated. The number one. Owen loves this movie. On every chance he gets, he watches The Little Mermaid. Now, at this point... He just is running up to the room and grabbing the remote. Now, his motor function went to hell, with one exception, his thumb on the rewind button. His brother taught him how to use it. Now, at this point, into the silence of about eight, nine months, he's murmuring a little bit of gibberish. He's saying, juice servos, juice servos, juice servos. Now, we think this is good, like a baby, you know, starting to get sounds back. Uh, Cornelia thinks he wants more juice, but he doesn't. He's, now, he went to the big boy cup about a year and a half before. He's back to the sippy cup. No juice doesn't want the juice. So we watched The Little Mermaid. So one thing we can do as a family, still, the four of us, up in the third floor of the rented house in Georgetown. And we're watching a scene where Ariel is making her Faustian bargain. And you know the scene. Everyone knows the scene. It's Disney. Stuff's in everyone's head.
You know, Ariel is a selfish girl. She wants what she wants. She'll pay anything to get it. She's actually working at Goldman Sachs now. She's doing fine. <laughs> She's doing her third marriage. The thing with Eric didn't work out. The prince thing doesn't, right? Usually the prince will prince. And so the sea witch says, it won't cost you much a trifle, really. Just your voice. Oh, and rewinds. One is like, oh, just watch the movie. Third rewind. Fourth rewind. Cornelia grabs me. It's not juice. It's, it's not juice. It's just. I grab Owen. Just your voice. And he looks at me for the first time in a year and says, juicer buzz. Juicer buzz. Juicer buzz. We call this our Helen Keller moment. Water. <laughs> I mean, Walt starts jumping on the bed. Oh, it's talking again. And, and Cornelia begins to cry. He's still in there. So we go to Rosenblatt the next day. And he's like, okay, sit down. I know you're very excited. We call this, you're going to hate this word, we call this echolalia. I'm like, oh, I hate that word. <laughs> it's, is it what I, yes, it's what you think. Echo? So like a parrot? Is, why would he pick those three words, just your voice, out of 89 minutes of gibberish? A child who just lost his voice! The sense is they don't understand what they're saying. That's at least the thinking. The sound. So that's where we are for years. Between the pet store and Helen Keller. Jump ahead. Owen, six years old. Almost seven. Now you've met me and Cornelia, you need to meet another member of the quartet, Walter, the older brother. Like many siblings of those with disabilities, he is already on his own. I see mom and dad have their hands full. I'm good. Like a little character out of Dickens. <laughs> Off of the world, David Copperfield. He gets emotional on only one day of the year. We don't even notice. Why? Because the story we tell of Walter is he's like a little Jewish Marine. Oh. They hit the beach and feel guilty to go back. But still, <laughs> anything, he can handle it. And two-part story, crucial, and he'll never leave his little brother behind. That's our narrative for Walter. So we don't even notice if he gets emotional only on one day of the year, his birthday. So on his birthday, Walt's in the backyard, the friends leave, Owen's back there doing something, Owen falls into the kitchen, he looks at Cornelia, he looks at me, back and forth, like something's happening. Now Owen at this point is up to a three-word sentence. After umpteen countless hours of therapy, I want juice is what he can say now. Three words. He looks at Cornelia, he looks at me and says, Walter doesn't want to grow up like Mowgli or Peter Pan. And off he goes. <laughs> it's like a thunderbolt went through the kitchen. What? What is that? <laughs> then Cornelia and I were struck silent. We can't stop talking for hours. He's in there. He's in there. That's what she says. After hours, she says, and I have to sleep. Because she's up every night. He doesn't sleep anymore. She's like, you're the crazy one. You wear the propeller hats at the birthday parties. Find a way back in. This is a bid for the husband to be the one who lifts the back of the Volkswagen. You don't get many of those in a life. So I go up to his room. Now he's sitting on the bed looking at a Disney book. I mean, literally, we have taken out a second mortgage to buy Disney crap. We have every single thing they sell. And he's looking at the book. He can't read, but he likes the pictures. And I see on the floor near the bed is a puppet. He loves this character. It's Yago, the evil psychic to the villain Jafar in Aladdin. Gilbert Gottfried, you know the character, the bear. I crawl across the rug. It's quiet again. I don't want to look at me. Not that that's much of a threat. I grab the puppet. I pull it up to my elbow. It's one of those like big $98 plush toys, you know. The idea I still know the price is telling you a lot. I push it up, I throw the bed spread over my head, and in Gilbert Godfrey's voice, I say, Owen, Owen, how does it feel to be you? And he turns to the puppet like he's bumping into an old friend. And he says, not good. 
I am lonely and I have no friends. Now I just bite down hard under the bed's breath. Say, stay <coughs> in character. <laughs> what would Yago say next? So I said, okay, okay. When did you and I become such good friends? Well, when I watched Aladdin, you made me laugh. And then we start to talk. And oh, and Iago. It's our first conversation since he's two years old. And after two minutes of this bliss, this orchestral loveliness, all of a sudden I hear him clearing his throat. <clears> he's <throat> only six and a half, so it's up here. <clears throat> and he says, I love the way your foul little mind works. That's Jafar. <laughs> I'm like, ah, we're speaking in Disney dialogue. That's the breakthrough. There it is. That's our leap from the top moment. I throw up the bedspread, I hug Owen, I grab Cornelia. Next thing you know, we're starting the next night what we call the basement sessions. We realized that after a few quick questions and a little exchange of dialogue, they need to memorize 50 Disney movies as sound alone, the whole pantheon. So we're going to play scenes. We go with Jungle Book first. You love Jungle Book. And because I'm blue. Other than the height thing, it kind of works, right? <laughs> you know, bare necessities, you know, is, is a concept that Baloo embodies for all humanity. Cornelius Bagheera, the protected panther, works. Walter is King Louie. <laughs> Tell me the secret of man's red fire, man cub, and Owen's Mowgli. That's seven scenes in, and we need the TV, because Owen's going to outrun you quick. So you need to refresh. <laughs> So we scene, 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 scene. That seven scenes in, there's a scene where, as Baloo, I say, you know, you'd make one great bear. And he says, you think so, Papa Bear? And, and then he hugs me. And I'm, I'm not sure if it's Mowgli and Baloo or, or me and Owie. And of course, Cornelia says, it doesn't matter. Mm. Of course, she's right. And off we go to a crazy future. For the, the day, I mean, we're living kind of a double life. You know, um, Walter's going to school, riding his bike in the middle of, of blizzards, because he doesn't want anyone to know his brother is in the car. Cornelia is doing everything short of murder to find a therapist that will help. You know, I'm interviewing presidents. Some of whom I know are not telling me the truth. I know. <laughs> and at night, we play animated characters. Every single night. Everything's somewhere in Disney. And it's all here somewhere. 50 movies, are you kidding? You know, so basically, we find scenes that fit moments in his life. Now, mind you, when you hear this, this is now the anchor of a new model that therapists and parents are using all over the world. They're called the great matching game. Find something in their area of deep passion, affinity, the so-called restricted interests that are part of the phenotype of autism. Find a way to live inside of it and then match it to themselves, their emotions, their place in the world, and off you go. It works. Over several years, he gets his speech back, little by little. Look, he's, he still has limits and and certain affect to his speech, but he got most of it back. He learned to read by reading credits, and then he emerges into a guy you're about to see. So this is Owen uh, as a 23-year-old at the second year of, uh, actually the third year of life at Riverview School out on Cape Cod. One of the best schools for folks on the spectrum. It's expensive as hell, about 75000 a year, so that pushes out a lot of people. But he gets there, and immediately what he does is start Disney Club. He says, I need friends. No other way I'm going to get them. The Disney Club grows from 12 the first year to 20 the second to 30, almost 40 kids here. So you're going to see what happens. Owen eventually runs Disney Club. Now, we didn't realize... There's a zillion of them. All these kids are just like them, what they're doing. They're neurodiverse. 
What does that mean? That means they're not going to fit one-size-fits-all models. It means they're going to find the thing that's their passion. In the wide world of content, of stuff, stuff that's often widely available, they're going to use it as a vessel. It's not a prison that we long thought in autism. It's not obsession. It's a pathway. You've got to get in there with them and live inside of it with them and respect their choice, which is something we never did. There's a reason he's picking that, as opposed to Harry Potter, as opposed to astronomy. It, it works based on a phenotype, based on how his brain works. In a way, it's a telescope into his neural correlates. So here he is at Disney Club. Now, it starts, Owen's girlfriend's in here too, you'll see her with him. She's a Dumbo girl, by the way. That's how he knew that was the girl for him. First Disney Club, Dumbo's the first movie. And I say to this young lady, why Dumbo? And she's like, it's my favorite. I said, okay, teach me. She's like, well, Dumbo doesn't talk. And I didn't talk for a long time. Nonverbal kids bond with nonverbal characters, of course. How could they not? They express all emotions without words. But then... Then I began to understand what it was about. You see, Dumbo, Dumbo's an outcast, and I was an outcast for a lot of my life. But I realized what it's about, you see. The thing that made him different, those ears, that was his greatest strength that allowed him to soar. That's what it is with me. The thing that makes me different is my greatest strength that allows me to soar. That's all I needed here. That's my girl. Are you getting more than that in 10 dates of small talk? Are you kidding me? <laughs> it's like a statement of individual purpose in the world. I mean, you don't even get that after 20 years of marriage, for Christ's sake. So, so here is Disney Club. Uh, Owen is the president, so he's got presidential powers, meaning that thumb again on the remote button. And all the kids talk. Let's see a little bit. May I have your attention, please? When everyone gets here, we'll begin. I started a Disney club so I can get to know more people and they can be around me so I can be more popular. It worked! <laughs> and I'm watching some of Lion King because this year's the big 20th anniversary of the original release of the Lion King. Yeah. Shall we? Yeah. The, the, not only am I a big Disney fanatic, but I also like to play magical movie scores on this piano. Yeah. We have watched parts of Disney animated films and discuss them and see what they're really about in our lives. Okay, so what's interesting here is that uh, for many, many decades, these restricted interests were viewed all the way back to Leo Connor and Hans Osberger as perseverative, obsessive, wheel in the ditch, because they don't fit, frankly, with some of our neurotypical, and that's the term of art, inclinations. We dance around like bumblebees on flowers, foxes rather than Isaiah Berlin's hedgehogs. These folks, more and more I'm realizing, and it's not just me, everyone's coming from every direction on this, including the leading experts, Temple Grandin, you know, uh, Kathy Lord, they're all in on this, is that there are more extreme versions of the rest of us with deep deficits and compensatory strengths. That's the key term here. Because what you're seeing here at Disney Club, and what you'll see in a minute in another very extraordinary video I'm going to show you, is exactly how it works. You know, uh, they're not going to succeed in most of the models we have now at work, the one-size-fits-all models that many of us are able to manage. Do this to get the reward. Do this to get your ticket punched for the next round of musical chairs. Please, your mom, get the A up on the wall. Most of them are not driven that way. They're internally driven. You have to tap intrinsic motivation to get to their deepest and most powerful capabilities. We tend not to do that. We want to shape them. Square pegs in a world that respects only round holes. You know, it took us a long time to realize that wasn't going to work. 
Trial and error. We tried. It didn't work. And it doesn't work, actually. What you're seeing here are a community gathering around a shared language, a lingua franca of their passion. Again, it's just an extreme version of us. You know, I can manage lots of different subjects. I can dance around. I was never able to do that. This is where he goes a thousand feet deep. And everyone in this room is able to express deep emotions through the language. That's the scene. And what about that other scene? The better scene is this one. You know what she says in that one? Yeah, I know. I love that. And you know what he says? Yeah. Interestingly, at the key moments in the movies here, um, you know, almost all the Disney movies end in the same way. Mm -hmm. So you look around Disney Club here in the third year, and uh, you'll see um, uh, lots of kids going like that. <laughs> and it's a perfect Disney kiss. You know, arms akimbo, chin up, tilt to the little, all in. <laughs> I love it. Yeah, one time in Disney Club, we had this moment among thousands, just one that dawns on me, where that kid Patrick, who plays the piano, he can play thousands of songs. By ear. Anyone you want. He does it now at senior centers. And he plays everything here at Disney Club. He's the Disney Club, he's, he became the president after Owen left. So at one moment in Disney Club, which has become like a giant therapy session, uh, they, Owen freezes it, he's still president, and it's when Snow White's lying on the slab and the dwarves are around her. And Patrick says, you can take the death of Mufasa and the shooting of Bambi's mother, but, but this is the saddest moment in all of Disney. And mind you, these are kids who for most of their lives are believed to not have emotional valency at all. I say, Patrick, I'm like a, a therapist without a degree. I'm like, oh, what are the dwarves thinking? Not bad, right? <laughs> See some professionals in the room? <laughs> he thinks for a minute, he goes, they're th thinking, is, is, there, is there more I could have done? The room is quiet as a church. There were kids in deep. And Molly, another one, just like Owen, says it's about the what ifs. And Owen says the what ifs will kill you. And they talk. I don't even need to be there. All this hidden, invisible, non-validated capacity comes pouring out. You know another thing that happens? They become a community, for Christ's sake. They're like, look at us. This isn't the land of broken toys. We've got stuff. We're good at this. You know, we're not all in the discard pile. And they feel like properly realized versions of who they are. This is the start of the big change. When the book came out, you know, we were hit with a tidal wave. Parents from all over the world called, saying, I now know who my kid is. And I know much of what I was getting from eminent specialists, people I trust, was part of an older way of thinking. But I didn't have the confidence to say, wait a second, this doesn't comport with what I see as a mom or a dad. But it's hard. You know, I'm not a doctor. I don't have a graduate degree in psychology or neuroscience, psychometric testing or any of it. It's hard to say, I think you're wrong. Often the parents do know best. They don't have the confidence, though, to challenge what they know doesn't fit, even if they don't know why it doesn't fit. So that's what happened. And we're hit with a tidal wave. Parents from all over the world, on the phone, and also saying, look, I don't have a Pulitzer Prize or best-selling books. My wife works out of the home, and I can't spend 10 years in the basement watching Disney. What do I do? So Cornelia and I got together. We had a moment around this time of crisis after all these crying parents are calling us and after I gave my speech in NIH where Tom Insel says, this is a reversal of the telescope. The Susskinds are right. Let's start moving in this direction. Owen and Emily are out on Cape Cod. We're driving them around. It's their two-year love anniversary. The two-year anniversary of the, their first kiss. 
No emotional balance? It's like Yeats. It's like a romance poet. So we're driving, they don't drive, and they're in the back seat, and Emily starts playing with Siri on her phone. And Owen goes, what's that? And she's like, oh, this is Siri. Everyone knows what this is. And she asks the funny questions. And after a minute, Owen goes, can you, can you ask in anything? I'm driving, Cornelia nudges me in the front seat. I'm like, what a great idea. So Owen, if you could ask in anything, where would you start? And Owen starts ticking off what he'd ask Siri if you could ask in anything. Well, the next week, I'm in California grabbing the inventor of Siri. It's a guy. It's a person. Adam Chire. And I said, well, Cornelia and I have actually thought a little about this, and we kind of know what we need. If we could be a voice in Owen's head every morning, we used to say, as he leaves on the bus, we would know the references he's already assembled to act as support, scaffolding, code breaker. But we can't be there to give them to him or to prompt him, or to remind him. So I think I know what I need you to build me. And we give him some specs. He's like, I think we can build that. So that starts about two years ago. You know, the outcome is what you're about to see. It's called Sidekicks. Owen names it. We actually, I mean, I know it's great having a Pulitzer Prize, and it is pretty great. You know, you get <laughs> the dependent clause of your own. It's already written. Um, Ron says, hey, Tom, a Pulitzer Prize winner. That's found alone in his apartment today at 86 years old. So, um, um, but having a, a, an allowance from the USPTO, the United States Patent Office, is pretty cool. And especially because we have a patent on something called Guided Personal Companion. And Owen is on the patent. Because he helped us come up with it. So what you're about to see is really cool stuff. What we did here is we created a kind of next generation of augmentative device. You know, part of what happens is when you get a lot of technologists in the room and say, hey, you're going to do something nice for humanity here, and I know you've got stock and you're going to be happy and you've crashed it out already, but this is, this is something bigger. You guys don't know an important four-letter word that I understand well called need. I've lived in the valley of need as a reporter and as a dad for 20 years. And we're going to build something to help communities in need tap the miracles of technology. So here's what we built. I'll just describe it and then you're going to see it. Basically, it's a version of Yago. It's a yada moment. How do you do it? Who's it? Uh, an avatar gets downloaded on every kid's phone. He gets a, he or she gets it. Mostly it's he's with autism, you know. But this works for all sorts of neurodivergent kids. So they get to pick the one they like. That avatar um, is a character. It's not a Disney character. It's one we invented. Uh, and when you, mom, dad, therapist, older brother, sister, anybody, talks into their phone, it comes to in real time in the voice of the character on the kid's phone. And then when the kid talks, you can hear it, either on a computer or a phone, type, or have content that you've got loaded up, because we've got thousands of clips from Disney and Warner. They're all cooperating with this. Whatever the kid's affinity is, it could be Harry Potter, Star Wars, Disney, anything, we've got the clips. And around the clips, we've put what we call sides, emotional, social valence, understanding perspectives. We put them as goals. So when you're on the console... You say, my kid's a Disney kid. Click. Now you have the whole Disney menu. And you say, and they're dealing with issues of bullying. Good. Click. Goal. Bullying. Now you've got 30 clips that they already have in their head, they're already using as a code breaker, that then stream across the platform through the kid's phone, and the character talks to them about what they feel and think and how they connect this to their life. I know. It's, it's a beautiful trick of the light. And the kid talks to the character. They love the characters. Many of them know a mom or dad's behind the curtain. You don't care. Actually, I wouldn't care either. It's kind of fun. And ultimately, they open like a window, just like Owen did with Yaka. So you're about to see the first three Spectrum kids to try it with their moms or, or dads. Every one of these kids 
book a higher level of receptive and expressive speech than the parents had ever heard, ever, under any circumstance. We all know who they are, so we know Frozen is her movie, Toy Story is his movie, and they're already loaded up in the thousands of clips. And the parents, this is the first time they tried it. It's about a three and a half, four minute video, and it's, it's very cool. This is her console. I like burgers. She... I like burgers. That's his phone. There it is. What like? Pizza. You share it with me. Would you share it with me? Yes. If I had asked him what he liked to eat, he would not give me that same information. That's a very simple question yeah. to us. I don't get an answer. I, I like pizza or a burger. I have visuals at home usually. Yeah. I have them on the fridge. And it's like, well, what do you think you like to eat? And, and he goes over there and he'll pick the visuals. At uh, home, he only do requests. Okay. Like, I want this, I want that. It's very hard for him to initiate conversation to express himself. He's where Owen was. Thanks. I want. The kid's a Toy Story kid. This is his oh, longest yeah. sentence ever. You're about to say it. Do you think it was okay? Or did he like it a lot? I like it a lot. 
Okay, awesome. Anything else you want to share with us? Uh, ideas? Well, if we get it. <laughs> <laughs> Do you have any other feedback for us about Psychic? Oh, it was really great. So we wound up 15 minutes for questions. I'll just tell you that there's a lot of science behind this, too. So, yeah, pretty cool stuff. You know, the now funded, um, uh, uh, actually a, a local fellow, uh, Seth Carmen funded um, uh, John Gabrielli at MIT, terrific uh, neuroscientist, and the Lurie Center uh, to do uh, a two-part uh, research initiative uh, to, to not only understand the neural correlates and neural substrates that underlie these affinities, and, and there's all sorts of things happening with that. Kevin Pelfrey at Yale is now down at NIH is doing it too. Uh, and also at the Lurie Center, which is the largest center for autism, they're looking at the specifics of how this will build uh, speech, uh, emotional valence, emotional identification, um, you know, all sorts of, of social engagement capacities, which we're finding. We've got 100, 200 kids who have done the pilot, and it's just what you're seeing here. You know, uh, fascinating data. Uh, the data, of course, is without parallel because there's so much of it being fed through the sidekick. Everything's caught on our servers. For my therapist friends, they're like, look, you know, we're flying blind, and we wouldn't admit that until I saw this. Now I can admit it. We have no idea what happens between Tuesday at 3 o'clock and the next week at 2 o'clock. We don't know if anything we did in the session is being used, inverted, not even tried. Parent reporting is terrible. Yes, we all know that. Now what you've got is essentially the first time we're getting analytics in the great miracle of analytics that we're hoping will take us to personalized medicine and a bright future actually being applied to this community. You know, one of the most exciting things that's happening is that a vast community, there are five million people with autism in the United States. It's one out of every 68 kids, one out of every 42 boys. It's four to one, boy to girl. That's 2.5% of the male population, 100 million plus worldwide. They're being seen with what Proust would call new eyes because people can see them through the telescope of their passion. And we have the data to show for it, which is crucial, and all of you know that. So that's what's happening here. You know, from need, yeah, but also from um, freeing yourself from a posture of cutting hopes and losses and instantly bending toward pathology. Like, we wouldn't have wished this on him in a million years. We found part of the problem was how we saw him differently. Saw ourselves too. That's the powerful part of this. So what's happening is that a new community is about to rise up. Owen looks like one in a million, 40 feet tall on the movie screen. And it's helping. The Washington Post wrote a beautiful review and they said something. They said, Owen Susskind is the first autistic spectrum leading man. <laughs> That's what changes cultures. And culture eats everything for breakfast. Just like Dustin Hoffman did in 1988. We're reversing that. Adding to it. Taking it to a new place. You've got to play with the fire they play with. You know, my class at Harvard is public narrative and justice. I get great civil rights activists of the last 40 years to come. John Lewis, Catherine McKinnon on sexual harassment. Evan Wilson on marriage equality. They talk to the kids at Harvard Law School, trying to help them understand what a bigger life looks like. Bigger, with all due respect, than working at Scout and Arms. In some ways, this is a public narrative that feels like justice. So, thanks for listening. Let's get some questions. So we've got 15 minutes. Let's do 15 minutes of questions, at least. Okay, who's going to go first? Just shout it out. Well, come on. Hi. Yeah, uh, hi. Hi. What, can you say what your name is? Oh, Peggy. Hi, Peggy. Hi. I have a friend who's a little 
Absolutely, absolutely. You know, look, look, I think what we're finding is that now one in four people are considered neurodiverse. We do Downs, ADD, ADHD, autism, OCD, it's a big basket. We call them cousin disorders. Downs is a little different, but many of them are disorders of, uh, or differences, if you will, of internal neural regulation. Uh, this is ideal for all of them, because what's happening is that, is that you've got the intrinsic motivation tap where their muscles, their compensatory muscles are able to flow free and be their guide. At the same time, we're building in all sorts of stuff, you know, the calendar, the biosensors, like our buddy here just talked about, tons of data that's getting integrated. And Microsoft has come to us, and Dartmouth Hitchcock, and Weinstein's a good friend of mine, saying, look, at the core of it, you've got the key thing, the joy and the connection where they are able to essentially feel themselves more fully through the content that comes to him or her through this. I mean, that's the great part about it. And I'll tell you something, I have not met a Downs kid yet who I do not consider emotionally gifted, not even one. And I've met hundreds of them now. You know, and, and I want to get my MIT social scientist to do a little study out on Cape Cod, which is to survey workplace atmospherics in 20 commercial establishments. And that's your baseline. And then plan a Downs kid or an autistic kid in the midst as an employee and watch what happens. Yeah, understand what you and I know. Uh, you know, and, and the data, you need the damn data, or those they don't believe you. So there they can get the data. Employees will treat each other better, they'll treat customers better. This person will be the favorite employee that people will come to visit. That's good for you, no matter what you do, whatever kind of business it is. So yes, is the answer to your question. Okay, someone else. How about you in the back? Yeah. I'm wondering if generalizes or anybody, I mean, I know this is very early, but have people tried to generalize this to other parts and other problems of the autism spectrum? I mean, I've been diagnosed as being on the spectrum, and I don't have these types of language problems. Hmm. Yes, absolutely. I mean, we're already building ones for uh, young adults and the adult community. But what you're talking about is, is the core of it, is that you already build supports for yourself. You know, things that your brain is, is, has compensatory muscles that mine don't neurologically. So you're out gathering all the time, right? Finding stuff that gives you a boost, gives you support, gives you a scaffold. Well, the fact is, is that you're going to be able to program your own sidekick. Because even some of the kids, remember when she said Paul Bart, Bart Mall Cop? That's what we're talking about. The kids realize there's someone behind the curtain, and they start telling the parents, can I feed it stuff? All right? Just like you're talking about. So what you'll have is you'll have a support that, that uh, carries with you into the art and act of living. You're going to have the biosensors. You're going to have it fitted with need and want as you move through the world. Stigma-free. Now, the nice part about it, and this is a little bit of the special sauce, is because it is context-aware, i.e. the coaches are feeding it, they know you, mostly, and it's domain-limited on your areas of interest that you use in these ways, it grows automation. And it grows automation faster than anything on the West Coast that tailors itself to you. There's someone here who knows you. It's not one size fits all, or it's not one to many, like Siri or Cortana. It can fit with one of those in the back, of course. You can plug that into the API and find out about pizza toppings and movie times. But what this is going to do, it's going to wrap around you as a personal support, tailor itself and customize to who you are. So that's already happening, which is neat. Okay, someone else. 
You and the way back there. Will it always require a live person to be monitoring? Less and less. Will it always require a live person to monitor? Less and less. That's the key to the automation, is that you need the person behind the curtain less and less. Now, there's another part of it, which is very, very interesting, that we built. When the pilot study started, a lot of kids were tapping it 20 times, like, where's my sidekick? Okay? Well, the parents are busy. They're not around. So we knew about this before because we came up with a concept, coaches on demand. Okay, you know where this one's going. Okay, so because, you know, Cornelia and I said, look, there might be some graduate student, like all these graduate students we knew all the years with Owen at AU or Georgetown or wherever, who were really good. And all of a sudden, what I get to do now is send up a flare saying, I want 10 coaches who are really good at Disney for a child who, let's say, is 12 years old with this profile. It's a bid and ask. It's a marketplace. All of a sudden, I've got 10 coaches on demand. They're in a rotation whenever the child needs them. They get on the console. They see the last conversation. They see the profile of the kid. They see the basic issues. And they see the affinities and the general desires that tap intrinsic motivation. Whenever the kid needs it, a coach is there. And I got quality controls the mom or dad because I get the manifest every night as to every coach conversation. This gives me the support I need to live my life. And what's beautiful about it is it grows automation because more and more you need the coaches less and less as the automation grows. And when the coach is needed, the bell rings and someone jumps behind the curtain. Another interesting thing is how free people are freer than this to talk to this. Some of you are Vygotsky people, inner speech. Vygotsky's a hot ticket in the last 15, 20 years. Some of you know a lot about him. He's kind of a Russian Freud. Came up with lots of ideas, died a while ago about inner speech. You know, when you're two years old, you verbalize everything out loud, and then you take your voice in, and it goes into executive function, etc., etc. Well, this is the first kind of support that nourishes inner speech, which mostly flaps around like a tether in the wind otherwise. That's lovely. That's part of it. And the coaches on demand are growing already. Um, there are four sessions tonight on two particular kids. Parents are loving it. The kids are growing. And they're feeling good, too. The kids are like, hey, I'm, I'm okay. I'm an expert. I'm better than you at this. Yeah, you're right. How's that feel? Good. Okay, I should wrap it up. Okay, it's called sidekicks.com. If you go online, we have a, we have a beta, and now there is a, a test flight version that parents are downloading. Uh, we'll have it up on Google Play and the App Store soon, but if you go to sidekicks.com now, you can, you, it's a little process, you go through it and you can get it, essentially download it on all your devices. You know, the team is a very high-end team. I had to call them from all over the country. We have the leading neuroscientists in the world, Temple Grandin's on the advisory board, Kathy Lord, everybody, because they say this is the only thing that works. And that's what Steve Hyman says. And Tom Insull. This actually is a, a nine-part equation that will help change the lives of not only the kids, but how we see them. And that's where it really takes off. Let me just finish by saying that our leader here is this kid in the movie. You know, Bob Iger from Disney calls up and says, how did he rewrite my narrative? i got a whole building of people here in Burbank for Disney who can't do that. With what was his IQ measured at? 72, Bob. Wow. I'm thinking that score is not meaningful. He said, I think you're right. But the way Owen puts it, just like all the little Joseph Campbells you saw there in Disney Club, he's like, well, here's the way it works. You know, when he started to see what the world saw of him, got thrown out of the school, was deemed uneducable, he decided he wasn't a hero, that he was a sidekick. So it's hard for us to hear. He said, no, it's okay, because the sidekicks are important. See, they're more interesting than the heroes, who are kind of flat. The psychics have a lot more stuff going on, more interesting. And, and the psychic's job is to help the hero fulfill their destiny. That's the key role. 
Then he says, you know, in fact, I think we're all sidekicks, really, at our best when we help others fulfill their destinies. And on that day, we find our inner heroes. That's what the future looks like. Us finding a way to find our inner heroes every day, a choice we make every morning. So thank you for listening today. Find